Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 287 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book is called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, I want to tell my audience that networking really works. In the 1980s, Oprah Winfrey went on a date with Roger Ebert. Now, Roger Ebert is a guy who was on television rating all the latest movies that are out in the theaters. And Oprah, at the time, she didn't know if she could go with ABC in terms of her show or King World when they wanted to syndicate Oprah's show. And the advice that Roger Ebert gave her made her worth $2.5 billion today. So understand that learning to meet new people that have the experience to guide you in life can literally change the outcome for you and many of the people around you. Our next guest is Genevieve Paturo. Instead of just dreaming about doing something great, she founded Pajama Program, which is changing the lives of children, but also impacting so many of their supporters' lives as well. Learning to listen to the voice in her heart changed her life forever and helped her become the person and the leader that she always wanted to be. And in the midst of it all, she found herself being interviewed by Oprah Winfrey. She mm -hmm. has learned that everything begins when we find purpose in our lives. So many of us are reevaluating our paths because we want more fulfillment. We want the work we do and the people we do it with to really make a difference in this world. This kind of thinking can transform how you do your job, how often office teams work together, how students work together, and how leaders at every level lead. Welcome to the show, Genevieve. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Of course. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. I knew that Oprah tie-in would get you really excited because I know <laughs> yeah. you and your interview with Oprah, I'm sure it meant quite a lot to you. There's no yeah. question about that. Yeah. Now let's go way back. Let's go back to the days of undergraduate. You decided on Fordham University in New York City, my birthplace. I'm sure you had many choices in terms of where you could go for college. So why did you decide on Fordham? Well, you know, I was born first in an Italian, very traditional Italian family. My dad off the boat from Italy. So I was not really following in the tradition of getting married and having children right away. I wanted this independent life and career. So I was planning on visiting colleges all over the United States until my parents heard of that and said, oh, no, you're not going anywhere. You're staying here. And here was Yonkers, New York. So I, disappointingly at first, of course, had to just settle on what was in the New York area. As it turns out, of course, there were great options. So I chose Fordham because it was a campus life. And although my parents also said, you'll live home and commute, I had other ideas that down the line, I could you know, sort of finagle my way into staying on campus and having a campus life. So rather than go to school at NYU or Columbia where it was streets of New York, you know, which I now love, mm. I want a campus life and Fordham was perfect. Yeah, I definitely get that campus life at Fordham. It is really a, a very, very nice campus. Um, I mean, some of the others, uh, my daughter is actually looking at Columbia and, and we mm -hmm. did a tour of Columbia. And it's interesting because like the buildings, they kind of shield you from the streets. And so you almost for a second forget that you're in the middle of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, Fordham has done a really good job with that. And, uh, and some of the others are creative in the way that they try to make a campus feel. But I certainly know where you're going with Fordham. That makes a lot of sense. And it's a great institution. I mean, there's no yeah. question yeah. about that. And you were a successful television marketing executive in New York City for 20 years when all of a sudden a little girl's question changed the course of your life forever and mm -hmm. suddenly you jump off the corporate ladder. What was that question? What happened there? Well, let me just say first that you mentioned Oprah and syndication. That was the TV business I was in, syndication. Yeah. So I actually know and knew King World and actually was invited 
during one of the national conferences to King World's welcoming of Oprah to their schedule. And she did a show from the convention. I got to see it before I changed careers. So um, so I, I feel like that's really special too, the syndication world to me. Mm. But yes, I was VP marketing for different syndication companies in New York. And it was a crazy busy life, as you can imagine. Being in New York City, being in the TV business, I was single. I wanted the full experience. I bought a place in Riverdale, which is a section of the Bronx, and I lived on my own. And I climbed that corporate ladder, you know, just every day, every day. And it was exciting. It was fun. I got to travel. There were lots of good things about it. Until one day, I heard a little voice in me in a quiet moment when I was sitting in my living room. And I heard a voice ask me, if this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough? And that's when everything stopped. I thought I thought I was happy. I thought doing what I was doing was exciting and fun. I said, it is, but there is something missing. And I did miss something probably that was tried to be instilled in me by my parents, a traditional family. I thought I'm going to be alone in 30 years if I keep going this way. So I wanted to bring children into my life. I loved my nephews, my godsons, my niece, but I wanted bring more children into my life. So I went to visit shelters at night and they, they let me read to the children. And so I read storybooks and I wasn't privy to the reasons they were in those emergency shelters because the police and social workers took them from a really dangerous and, you know, frightening time to safety. So I was reading to children who were afraid, who were being just at the beginning of the processing it's part of the you know they're they're being removed from the only home they knew and they were frightened and some were crying and they they the clothes weren't you know clean or fitting properly and when I saw them going to sleep at night after I read to them huddled together and crying and in the same clothes the visions of my mom and and, and four of us kids and how she put us to sleep and the love and comfort and snacks and you know laughing and kissing and of course we were in pajamas you know there was no question and they, these little kids didn't have pajamas on. So I brought them the next time. I went shopping and bought all kinds of you know, new pajamas to give them with the books. And a little girl was so afraid to take them from me. And I couldn't imagine why. And I tried and tried. And it took me quite a while to, to just let her feel comfortable. But she still wouldn't take them. And she whispered in my ear, Miss, what are pajamas? And I had to explain to this little girl that you change for bedtime and that she could keep these. They would fit and how snugly she'd feel. And I couldn't stop thinking about her and how many other hers and hims were there that you know didn't know what pajamas were and were sleeping in clothes that just, I couldn't imagine how they could even have a, a, a nice night's sleep in some of the things I saw them wearing. So that changed everything in, in my heart and then in my mind about how I wanted to continue my life. Wow, that's an incredible story. And so once you had that aha moment, how all of a sudden did you find yourself being interviewed by Oprah Winfrey? Um, I wish I could say it jumped right to that. <laughs> but it was um, it was quite a, a scary time. You know, I was reevaluating everything. I had a mortgage. I had expenses. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about how I'd ever get this done, how many children there were. And all I, all I was doing was literally shopping for pajamas and going to, to shelters and spending my time there. And my, my brain was full of more things I wanted to do in that vein and less that I wanted to do in my job. And I met a great guy at that time. And, you know, he was one of the first people I told. And when I told another girlfriend, she looked at me like I was crazy. So she didn't know why I would do this, why I would give up my career. How was I going to pay my bills? And I didn't have any answers. So I quickly stopped telling people. And then I trusted him and I told him and he said, go for it. And later I married him. And um, it was just a, a scary and exciting time all at once. And people wanted to help when I started to really feel comfortable opening up and talking to people and people started to help. And somebody put a small article in parenting magazine and thousands of boxes arrived at my Riverdale co-op and they just wanted to help. And, and somebody said, if, if you can send us your 501c3, 
we'll send you a grant. I didn't know what that was. So here I was saying, well, I'm responsible for to these people and I have to find out what this thing is. And it's of course, nonprofit status. So I figured that out. I mean, I sweated the whole time, not knowing every step of the way and having to be brave enough to ask for help. And it, it was working out slowly, slowly, you know, barely making all ends meet and got a call from a producer on Oprah show who said that people were writing in about this lady giving pajamas to kids in shelters. And she, she wanted to hear the story. Wow. Wow. What an incredible story. Um, that is just amazing. I'm so happy that you found your purpose in life and then you got to talk about it on such a big stage. I think it's just fantastic. I and I'm know. sure the college mm -hmm. students who are listening right now, they want to find their purpose too. So how do you suggest the college students who are listening right now find out what they're supposed to do? Well, I like to speak at colleges now. You know, I, I gave up the executive directorship after 20 years and I'm, I speak about being the founder and finding your purpose now. And I do speak to colleges because even younger, you know, I speak to high schools too. The younger you think about it, the smoother every decision afterward becomes because you have a North Star mm -hmm. and nobody taught me about purpose. You know, I, I thought I'd be lucky to get a job I liked. I didn't know I had a purpose. I thought special people had purposes, but there's something in you that you are meant to do. And it, it could be anything. And there's always a way to make a living. And if you have a job or you want to do something that's not your purpose, that's okay. But the trick is to let that purpose be part of your life. So if you want to be um, a CPA, but you love playing the piano, you must play the piano. You can't put it on the back burner. You can't say, well, I chose my career. If you're not choosing your purpose as your career, and even if you can't make it to Carnegie Hall as a pianist, there are ways that you can still make a good living in the world of music. So think a little bit outside of that grand goal of playing at Carnegie Hall, because it will still give you that fulfillment to be in that world, it's, it's amazing. And the idea of giving it up just because you only think there's one way to do it is, isn't, is it necessary? Is it necessary? But if you have a job or you, you are going in one direction, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and you want to play the piano or you, you want to work with, with animals or with seniors, you must bring that into your life. Even for an hour a week, it will change everything. It makes everything easier. I love that. Now, shared vision is extremely important, whether we're talking about a business or whether we're talking about a fraternity or sorority or student organization, we have to have some kind of shared vision. And you created something called the Purpose Acer Business Training Program to align the goals of the company with the goals of the employees for that shared vision. Talk to our audience a little bit about what that process is like. Yes. Um, it's a very personal process. It's personal to me because that's how I grew pajama program for over 20 years nationally with staff and volunteers. And right now we all are looking for purpose. You know, we've come out of the, the worst of the pandemic, reevaluating what we're, what we're doing. And some of us didn't have a choice, but we are changing our careers and some are contemplating making a change. And within the work space and how it's evolving, everyone's not on the same page yet. It's very, it's very different. It's, you know, it's, it's also summer. So people are jockeying sort of for a position in the fall. And a lot of it depends on how people feel where they're working and leaders need to communicate the purpose, their own purpose, how they feel they're making a difference in their community and in the, for the greater good with their company. And they need to communicate that on every level down. And every employee needs to know they're respected, they're seen, they're making a difference, that they're heard and aligning the purpose. You know, what do the employees want? What does each one want? It makes a difference because you're investing in each other. The leaders are investing in hiring those people that they hope will continue for a long while. And the employees are investing their time 
you know, especially the young ones, they want to, they want to match. They want to feel like there's an alignment. And if there's early on in the hiring process, if there is not, that's okay. Cause that's the time to find out whether you're all in and excited together on the same page or if not. And so the earlier, the better to, to take this training program, which I facilitate, it's to get to know yourself, your leader, your employees, and see if there are changes that can be made. Because I think we're all in for a lot of changes now. Yeah, that's a great exercise to do with companies. It really is, especially if you want to hire Gen Z students. I got to tell you, they care about shared vision. They care about shared values. And if they're not in alignment, I tell you what, Gen Z is going to go somewhere else. They're going to leave yeah. and they're going to find another company that allows them to go out and change the world. They really want to partner with their employer to change the world in a positive way, whether that be the environment or what have you, whatever it is that they're passionate about, but they want to change the world and make it a better place. So companies yeah. really need to start yeah. thinking about um, their shared vision and shared values. And I love your Acer business training program because I do think it will help companies to think uh, about that alignment, uh, which is mm -hmm. really, really fantastic. Now, a lot of college students recently graduated here in the spring and they're out there trying to find uh, their dream job. What are some resources and action steps for the college students listening right now to reach their goal of getting their dream job at graduation? Well, certainly every school has the counselors and that's one stop. But, you know, in the real world, there are so many ways now for us to reach out to people who are doing our dream job, who are in that field. And people, we all want to help each other. Mm. I can't tell you how many people I connected to on social media during the pandemic that were, were in all walks of life I was interested in learning more about. So I always say you don't know how many people are in your network until you start reaching out and asking people, you know, I want to be in music. I want to be, um, you know, a writer. Who do you know? Who do you know? Look on all your, uh, look at all your connections and reach out and talk to people. People want to help. Everybody wants to be the expert. Everybody wants to be sought, sought uh, after to give advice. So ask, you know, I it took me a long time to get over the feeling that if I was asking, I would look stupid. And especially because I had come so far as a successful business person in the corporate world. And now I was so embarrassed to say, I don't know anything about this, you know, and it took me a while to open up, but there are so many people that we can now connect with in so many ways, our networks and our social networks and reach out and talk to everybody in that field that you're dreaming of. I love that answer. And you're right. I mean, with LinkedIn, now you can reach out to just about anybody. Uh, same thing with Twitter. I mean, you can reach just about anybody on there as well and send them a message. And I tell you what, you know, we as executives, we don't want to be sold to. So, you know, I think there's that. But if you're like a college student and I don't get any hint that you're trying to sell me anything, mm -hmm. that you truly just want advice on, you know, which path to take or how to get to the next level, I tell you what, I'm going to take that call and I'm mm -hmm. going to set up an appointment. I might not have an hour to give you. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you because my schedule is just bananas. But I will spend time with you and get you to where you want to go just because I wish I had those kinds of connections as a kid. And, uh, and if I could help one person get to where they need to go in life, I mean, there's no better feeling than that, you know? So I agree, um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think we need to just get over it and just reach out to the person we really need to get to. Um, yeah. And more than likely they're going to help you because most people want to help. Most people are good. Right. So I like that a lot. All right. So um, how can college students gather all of their human connections that they have, you know, whether that be family or business associates or people on campus, how can they gather all of these connections and then organize them properly to get the action that they want? Well, I think we, we never know who our friends know and who our connections know. And we all have networks. You know, I see people emailing a whole bunch of people asking for help and I'm one of them and I don't mind. So I always say, if, you, if I can do anything, put me on your email list. And I think people people are on email 24 seven, they're on texts. Mm -hmm. Email a bunch of your friends, you know, email and ask them, who do you know? I really wanna be a writer. Who do you know that, you know, can, can give me some advice? 
it's an honest you know, request. Who, like you said, who's who's going to ignore that? I'm going to ask my friends who are writers, and I have. Can you give 20 minutes to this to this person? He's seeking. She's seeking people out. This is brave. This is what we want to encourage each other to do. So make a list, call your friends, email your friends, make it casual and just say, I'm reaching out because I know in my heart, I want to be a writer. I know in my heart, I want to teach. I'd love to hear about people's experiences. Who do you know? I will, I will reach out. Just, just make a connection for me. Very, very good advice. Why do you think a vision board can be so helpful? Oh, I love it. I'm looking at mine. Um, <laughs> you, you see, you see your future in pictures, and we and we are emotional when we see pictures. You know, hearing words and and saying, you know, I want a house, I want a beach house, I want a Maserati. That's okay, but your mind will then show you a picture. So look at a picture of it and. I mean, there's magic in it. We've all heard it. And I know there was, Oprah was on my vision board. And um, how it, every time you look at it and it, it's an emotional picture. And, and I always, I teach how to make a vision board. It has to be a picture that calls to you. You can't open a magazine on beautiful homes and just pick one. It, you have to look through it. And if there's nothing in the 180 pages of pictures that calls you, get another one. When that picture of the house, that car, that job, anything calls you, that's the one. Yeah. Because otherwise it's it doesn't belong to you. Yeah, I love that. You know, I live in uh, Nashville, Tennessee and I was scrolling through social media earlier today and uh, there was a picture of a Lamborghini uh, <laughs> that I saw and the, the article was talking about the fact that the uh, Ferrari and Lamborghini dealerships are now coming to Nashville, Tennessee and they're wow. going to open one in downtown Nashville. Um, and I looked at that photo and it just spoke to me. I don't know what it was. I mean, I, I've seen Lamborghinis my whole life. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, when I was a kid, I remember having posters on my wall. That was like the big thing when I was a kid is to have posters all over mm. the place. And I remember looking at a, a picture of a Lamborghini um, and it was across my wall. And I said, you know, one day I'm going to have that. And then I'm scrolling through social media and all of a sudden, you know, I see that picture that sparks that same reaction of like, Okay, when is that Lamborghini going to be yours? You know, yeah, it's kind yeah, of like a little out. reminder. <laughs> yeah. So I like that vision board. I think that's really good. I think I'm going to try to implement that here in my office and just look good, at it. Good. Yeah, because I think it definitely is motivational. There's no question yeah. about that. Yeah. So what should college students do if they realize that maybe they, they took a wrong turn? It could be in their major um, or even their first job. What should they do if they realize they made a mistake? Well, there, there are two two ways you can do it fast or slow. So depending on your nature, depending on your circumstances, um, but I but both are are equally. It's both. Um, there's one way to do it, and that's just to do it because you, the longer you stay on the wrong path, the harder it is to move, and then the less uh, motivated you are to do it because it gets comfortable. So first of all, you know what your heart is telling you to do, and you know that. 30 years, 40 years is a long time. So you got to do what you love to do, what's calling you. And then second, you definitely have to figure out what you need to do to get there. And that's, again, reaching out to people for the steps to do it. And take those steps, make yourself a plan. Now, my plan was literally paper and pen. I did five-year plan with five lines on a paper. It was, But you know what? When you want it so badly, you can, you can that'll work for you. So make a plan, figure out also who's, in that circle that will be affected and figure out how to get your cheerleaders, get them to be your cheerleaders. Or if unfortunately some of them wouldn't be, then you need to get cheerleaders because you need to have that support system. You know, I didn't have that early on. Like I said, I went to a friend I thought I'd trust and she blew my idea away. And it took me a while to stand up. And I realized I should have gone to family and friends that I felt would have my back before I started with a stranger who, you know, didn't have, you know, didn't have my best interest at heart. She just saw it as a practical mistake, but line up your cheerleaders and they will, every time you're reluctant to take a step or you reconsider, am I really going to do this? They'll say, you need to do this. <laughs> 40 years is a long time. 
That's a great suggestion. I absolutely love it. Now, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Mm -hmm. And I sense that you like good food, too, because you've spent a lot of time in New York City where I love to eat. Um, you know, it's just you get me some pizza, some bagels, and, I, and I'm good <laughs> to go. Um, but, you know, the next time I'm in, let's say, Irvington, New York or New York City, for that matter, where should I go for a great meal? Where do you like to go? Oh, wow. Well, I'm an Italian, so I always look for really good Italian food. So um, if somebody makes a good lasagna, if somebody makes a good meatball, mm -hmm. then, you know, everything is going to be good. So I always look for reviews that have, you know, special meatballs. Um, Sunday dinner, you know, there's one restaurant near me in Irvington and they have a Sunday dinner. And I haven't, you know, nobody else has that, but they know it means the Italian way of the pasta and all the meats in the gravy, or if you want to call it red sauce, we call it the gravy growing up. You know, that's going to be special just because they called it that. But in New York, you can find Little Italy. You can find anything in Manhattan. And, you know, yesterday I sat outside, I had a lobster salad on the sidewalk of Manhattan and a glass of wine. And, you know, it was just heaven. Yeah. Little, little Italy is the place to go because, boy, oh, boy, you really can't go wrong, right? I mean, mm. the food there is just fantastic. And uh, now I'm living in Nashville, Tennessee, so... You know, I get a lot of barbecue, but I mean, the Italian food, it's just not the same. I mean, the yeah. pizza, no, forget it. It's an imposter. Um, yeah. Even the pasta, you know, the fresh pasta that you can get there in Little Italy, the cannolis. Oh, my gosh. Mm. <laughs> it's yes, just, yes, yeah. It's just, uh, oh. yeah, it's just not the same when you start traveling around the country. You're like, mm, yeah. not quite as good as Little Italy. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think I have found as good a barbecue place here yeah that See, I, do I mean there are some places. things that nashville does really well i yeah. mean barbecue is certainly one of those things but when you grow up and you literally are born in manhattan there are certain foods that it becomes really hard to part with yes 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 <laughs> all right so if our college student listeners if they want to connect with you or they want to bring you in to speak on their college campus where should they go to connect with you my website genevievepituro.com and just email me from there and say, you want to talk? And I'd love to listen. I'd love to brainstorm and tell you what I did right, what I did wrong, if it helps you. And we can also talk about anything I can do to speak at your, your college or group or whatever. So GenevievePituro.com. I love it. And the book, of course, is Purpose, Passion, and Pajamas. Go and check that out. And uh, I'm going to spell Genevieve's name. It's G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E-P-I-T-U-R-R-O.com. Go and check out that website. Go and connect with Genevieve. I know that she would make a fantastic speaker on your college campus talking mm -hmm. about that journey of purpose, passion, and pajamas to help college <laughs> students find what they're passionate about to go out and make the world a better place. Genevieve, what can I say? You're my hero. Fantastic work that you're doing. I love the mission. I really connect with that. And I just want to say thank you for what you do because it inspires other people to go out and find their purpose as well. So thank you. Oh. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for inviting me to share my story. Of course, it's my pleasure. And to our audience, if you like this talk with Genevieve, make sure that you like it. Make sure that you share it with other college students on your college campus, on social media. And we hope to see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. And we're going to see you next time.